do make sure you have signed in, Barbara Buzzick, and that you get a copy of the reading list if you have not done so already. And I will uh, get in, uh, I'm gonna, I'll start out as I do in all the first classes with some kind of uh, housekeeping details. And uh, then we will get into some content for today. But before I do any of that, let me open with a word of prayer. We thank you, our Father and God, that you desire for us to gather, to study your word, to study about you, that you have called us to love you and to worship you with our hearts and souls and minds and strength, and we commit ourselves to that very thing. We pray, Father, that you would, by your spirit, be present with us today. Open our minds and hearts. Teach us what we need to know of you through this study. Help us retain it and help us by that knowledge uh, grow in our relationship with you and in our lives of service. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, Systematic Theology 1. Uh, a couple of details. First, I, was, I, I keep yelling at you all to make sure you've got a reading list. That one sheet of paper back there is it it's got two things. On one side of it, it has the description of all three of the classes in this term of, system, of uh, Lakeside Institute of Theology. Old Testament historical books, which we started on Wednesday. You can still get in on that. You've only missed one class. Yesterday, the letters of Paul. Yesterday, we did an introduction to the life of Paul and also the book of Romans. And I should have told you all that uh, our Friday morning Bible study, which we have here at the church at 10 o'clock, we just started a, an in-depth study of the book of Romans. So if you were in the class yesterday and you would like to get into the detail, because yet I was, for those of you who were in the class yesterday, I kept saying... If you don't do anything else in Bible study, make sure you study the book of Romans. Um, and so we are doing a, 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 our intensive interactive Bible study on Friday mornings on Romans. We just started that. So, and then today, of course, Systematic Theology 1. This class will meet for seven weeks, this being the first of those seven weeks. Um, and uh, instead of eight weeks, I apologize to anyone who was planning to come to the class. Uh, I, we had announced and publicized that it would be starting two weeks ago. I simply wasn't able to start it two weeks ago, so my apologies if that created a problem for you. Um, the reading schedules on the other side of that sheet, it will tell you at the bottom for Systematic Theology 1 what your reading needs to be each week. Now for today, we actually have page 15 to 43. Um, that's not a lot of reading. You can catch that up as part of your second week. Um, Today we're going to do an introduction to systematic theology, and then next week we will start with the, the systematic doctrines, starting with the Word of God. You, I'll, I'll just make a note here. Systematic theology, which I'll define for you in a little while, systematic theology almost always starts with the doctrine of the Word of God, meaning Scripture, because that's the source of authority we have for everything else. In other words, we don't get into talking about the Trinity or Christology, the study of the doctrine of Jesus, or uh, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, or anything else, until we first establish from where do we draw these things. And so the doctrine of the Word of God is almost, almost always the first doctrine or set of doctrines that you study. And that's true in uh, Grudem's book. Now, um, if you don't have the book, this is it. Oh. Um, <laughs> this book will suffice for two classes. We will use this book for both Systematic Theology 1 and Systematic Theology 2. If you haven't looked at it, lest you be fearful, um, it actually, Grudem has done an excellent job of presenting the doctrines, the systematic doctrines of the Christian faith, in a, a very lay-oriented approach, so that it is very readable. How many of you have started reading it already? Do you find it, you find it quite readable? It's, it's a, a, and that's one of the reasons I got it. He deals with the doctrines, but he deals with them in a way that I believe is very accessible. Um, you okay? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, we need a few other people to help up here. I think. Yeah. Just, just kidding. Sure, I was going to say you can buy books at the break, but there you go. Catherine, you're also the one that took mail people to go right in the middle of our service. Too, right? uh -oh. Just teasing. Uh, <laughs> so um, let me do a couple of uh, housekeeping things. At the first of each of our uh, courses, I do this: the policies and requirements. As you know, or you probably wouldn't be here, all of the courses that we offer are free. But if you are desiring to get either a certificate, a certificate of biblical studies, or a certificate of biblical studies and uh, biblical maturity, then you do need to purchase the book. If you are uh, looking to get a degree, same thing. We have degrees, a Master of Theology, and a Master of Theology in Ministry. 
Um, we are licensed by the government of Mexico to offer those, but as I always say, I don't ever want to be accused of misleading somebody, we are not accredited by any of the North American accrediting associations because they don't get here. We are licensed by the government of Mexico to give certificates and degrees, but you can't go back to the states and apply for a position teaching theology based upon, if they say you have to have an MDF or a Master of Arts in Theology based upon this. Now you might be able to, they might accept it, but it's not the typical degree, it's not part of an accredited program. If you are in these certificate or degree tracks, you can miss no more than one class of the seven we're offering um, without making it up, and you need to talk to me about that. But all of the courses are videotaped, all the videotapes are online, and all the materials are online. Let me, uh, a, a side note here. We, we didn't have sessions for a couple of months, and I got out of, out of sync, and so I haven't yet gotten back in the habit of trying to have these things up the morning of the class. I will try to have the notes up the morning of the class from now on with the kind participation of my wife Carolyn because she's the one who posts all this stuff for me. Uh, and the videos we will get up as soon as we can after the classes are done, but that takes some time because it goes through a multi-hour conversion process from the camera to being able to post them online. So that takes a little while. But I will do the best I can from now on that at least by the morning of the class, the notes will be up because I know some of you like to pull them up on your, your uh, tablets or print them out before you come. And I'll try to do that. I can't promise because there are times when schedule being what it is, I'm still preparing the notes that morning, but I'll do what I can. Um, if you are in a certificate or degree track, you are required to take a final exam. I encourage everyone to do that. But if you're in a certificate or degree track, you must take the final exam and make at least a 65 on it. Now, Really no excuse for not making a 65 or better on these tests because, as you all know, two weeks before we get to the last class, the final exam, I will give you a printed document which is called Everything You Need to Know About Systematic Theology 1. And if you study that document that I prepare and give to you, you will both know what I think is critical from our class and you will have everything you need to know to pass the test. Is that not true, people who take yes. classes? Okay. Yes. So don't worry about that. And in fact, even if you're not taking it for credit, I strongly encourage you to study those notes and to take the test because you will learn more. Very simply, if you study for a test and take the test, if you're not taking it for credit, who cares if you get a 25? You'll still learn something. Uh, so I do encourage you to do that. You do. You are required to receive a passing grade of at least 65 or higher. And again, um, and if you are interested in being in a certificate, a degree program, the Master of Theology or Master of Theology Ministry, I do want you to, at some point to talk to me about your goals and expectations, how you hope to use that. Mainly because I want to make sure that our students are receiving everything they need. That we're we're providing the stuff you need in order to be able to pursue ministry if that's your goal. Okay. Any questions about any of that? Please do forgive me as I, if I drink tea as we go along because I have a cold and my medicine is making my mouth dry and just miserable. I'm just going to curl up here and go to sleep. <laughs> Uh-oh. And you're going to teach. Uh-oh. Yeah, Carolyn will take over. <laughs> okay. Um, systematic Theology 1. Today we are dealing with an introduction to systematic theology and I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about why a lot of Christians don't even think theology is a good idea, and why that's wrong. Um, I have a real bias here. I've been looking forward to teaching this class because my own academic background has had a strong focus on systematic theology and philosophical theology. Later on, in a future term of the Instituto, we will be, I'll be teaching a class in philosophical theology. The biggest differences between biblical theology, dogmatic theology, systematic theology, um, philosophical theology, is where do you start? You know, from what premise do you start? Philosophical theology, for instance, because I'm not going to get into that today, I will talk about the others. Philosophical theology starts with the same questions that philosophy starts with. What is the meaning of life? What is the nature of reality? You know, uh, epistemological questions like how can we know? But then, because it's theology, it moves into a Christian you know, it uses the scripture, it uses the history of the church, it uses the things God has revealed to us to answer those questions. Whereas philosophy doesn't. It deals with a purely mental exercise. So the difference in philosophical theology and some of the others is where does it start? Philosophical theology starts with the same questions that not that secular philosophers start with, but answers them from a Christian perspective. Okay? Same thing is true with systematic theology, biblical theology, dogmatic theology. They all get to the same point if they're done right. 
but they start with different, at different places. I'll explain that in a minute with regard to systematic theology. It's, it's one of the reasons we need an introduction to it. Next week we will deal with, as I said, the doctrine of the Word of God. And then the, doc, the third week, the doctrine of God. What do we believe about God? And then we four doctrines of creation and providence, meaning God's control of <coughs> all that he created. Week five, doctrines of the supernatural, I have called it, which include miracles, prayer, angels, and demons. Week six, the doctrine of Christ, or Christology, as it's often called. I try not to use um, theological words here, but I'll introduce you to them as we go along. Every area of topic has a theological name. Christ, the study of Christ is, the doctrine of Christ is Christology. The study of the Holy Spirit is, um, it just went out of my head, is pneumatology. You know, pneuma, breath, spirit. Uh, the study of salvation, the doctrine of salvation is so, soteriology. The, of sin is hamartiology. So there's a big word for all of those things. I will introduce you to those words so that you'll be able to recognize them if you ever run into them again, but I'm going to try to stay out of the heavy-duty theological language as we go through this class, in the same way that Wayne Grudem has. You know, he, he introduces words, but he doesn't, you know, that's not the thing he usually presents, that's not the, the style he presents in. And then finally, week seven, we will deal with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and the final exam. Now, this is Systematic Theology 1. We will get to Systematic Theology 2, which will be the second half of this book, next term, all right? So you don't, you're only going to deal with half of this book, so don't, don't get too overwhelmed if you try to carry it home. Um, okay, uh, I want to start um, with a cartoon. This is, of course, Peanuts. It's Linus and Lucy, his sister. They're looking out the, at, at rain. Lucy says, boy, look at it rain. What if it floods the whole world? Linus says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that it would never happen again, and the sign of the promise is the rainbow. Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. Linus says, sound theology has a way of doing this. <laughs> this is why we're studying systematic theology. Because sound theology has a way of taking great loads off our mind. Sound theology gives us understanding, it gives us direction on the challenges of life, if it's done right. And we're going to talk about that as we go along. As again, I'm going to spend probably most of the second half of this uh, today telling you why people often say theology is a bad idea. Um, I mean, there's, there's Bethany College in West Virginia when it was founded in the 19th century, the revivalist minister who founded it wrote it into the charter that they would never have a professor of theology, nor would they ever have any text for study uh, except the Bible. Wow. Alexander Campbell. Oh, was that who founded Bethany College? Yes. Okay, I didn't even know his name. Um, there was a, a popular preacher, teacher, radio minister has been known to say on more than one occasion, happy is the Christian who has never met a theologian. Whoa. Okay, both of those things reflect a completely wrong idea about what theology is. Now, there is bad theology, but there is good theology. You know what? There's bad and good of everything. Anything can be done poorly or can be done well. And so, good theology is critical. It takes a great load off our mind. It, it teaches us the things we need to know. It keeps us pointed in the right direction. It keeps us from falling victim to heresy. And I'm getting into the second half of my talk today. Okay. Um, what can and should you expect from Systematic Theology 1? I've done this in some of the classes in the past, but I, I want to do this because, again, some people are probably in this class going, I'm not too sure about this. This may be too hard, or it may be, you know, I'm not sure what, what this is going to be all about. By the end of this class, assuming that you attend the lectures and you read the materials, there are some qualifiers there. You should have a good sense of the major theological doctrines of the Christian faith, in other words, the major beliefs of the Christian faith, as well as a system for organizing those doctrines. Later in the class, I am going to give you a, a set of categories, very simple, three categories, which all beliefs fall into one of those three in terms of its level of importance. Okay, and we'll discuss that. And not all denominations, not all religious Christian bodies agree on what fits into what category, but it will give you something you can hang the Christian beliefs on. 
And we will begin to investigate things like the doctrine of the Word of God, the doctrine of God Himself, of Christ, of the Holy Spirit, of the Word, etc. All right? Any questions about where we're going with this? This should be fun. Okay? If it's not, I'm doing it wrong. All right, so first, what is theology? And I'm going to give you several definitions for the different types of theology and talk about those differences. First is theology in general. Theology means the study of God. It comes from the Greek words theos, which means God, and logos, which means study or reason or wisdom. So Christian theology is thinking reasonably about God or the study and effort to understand God as he has revealed himself in Scripture. It is critical to realize that Judaism and Christianity, and the claim is made of Islam as well, are revealed religions. Our faith as Christians is based upon what God has chosen to reveal to us. We didn't just go out and find this under a rock. It didn't involve some magical glasses and golden tablets that we found in a cave. That's not where Christianity comes from. Christianity is a revealed religion. So we will always talk about that the, the theology is an effort to better understand and study what God has revealed of himself to us, as well as uh, of us. I mean, there's the doctrine of humanity, which is what are we supposed to understand from a Christian perspective about ourselves. So that's the general definition of theology. I'm going to give you a couple of other definitions that might be helpful as we go along that are a little bit that have a little bit different slant to them, but that's a general definition of theology. I then want to give you a definition, and if you took our New Testament or Old Testament theology classes, I've got, this is some material. Some of you weren't in those classes, so I need to give you this, and it doesn't hurt those of you who have heard it before to hear it again. I told you in one of the classes this week, if you were here, that one of my best seminary professors said that the most important chair or professorship at any seminary should be the professor of the redundant and repetitious. Because almost everything that's really important that we, that we should know, we've already heard, but we've forgotten. So you can, you can hear this stuff again. Biblical theology, more specifically, is the study of doctrines found in the Bible arranged according to their chronological and historical perspective. For instance, the theology of the Pentateuch, or the theology of John's writings. So, the definition to give you for, for theology is just general. Biblical theology, remember I told you a minute ago, the difference between theologies is where do they start? Biblical theology starts by opening the Bible. and says, what's in here? What does this say? And then tries to come to an understanding of that. Almost always, biblical theologies are oriented around New Testament. You'll notice we've had two theology classes in the Institute so far. Old Testament theology and New Testament theology. Those were both biblical theologies because they started with one of the major sections of our Bible. So biblical theology opens the Bible and says, this is what it says, what does it mean, what does it teach us, how can we understand it, how do we relate it to other things. But it starts with the Bible text. All right? That's not to say the others don't rely heavily on the Bible text. It's just they may start somewhere else and then go there. Does that make sense? The third, which is the one we're going to be dealing with, kind of theology, is systematic theology. Systematic theology is the division of theological doctrines by systematic categories or groupings in order to better understand their final meaning and relevance for today. It, there, in systematic theology, you may have a theology of angels, which is called angelology, of all things, okay? or of salvation, soteriology, or again, of, of, of well, there's a lot of different ologies that I get to write you. The point there is, instead of going to Scripture and saying, okay, what's this say? It says, it starts from the place of saying, um, what, what do we know about the nature of God? It asks the question first as a category. And then it goes to Scripture and finds all the places. So it's not, it doesn't have, you don't have a systematic theology of the Old Testament or the New Testament or a systematic theology of the writings of John. Systematic theology starts with categories and then says, let's go to the Bible and see what it teaches us anywhere in the Bible about that. And so it simply organizes it differently. It doesn't, it doesn't start with or hang all of our beliefs on a biblical reference, it hangs it on a topic. The nature of Jesus Christ, the authority of the Word of God, whatever. It, go, it starts there and then goes to the Bible. You see that difference? 
That's what we're going to be focusing on here, and that's why this is different than the New Testament and Old Testament theology classes we've already had. The, the fourth kind of theology I will mention is dogmatic theology. Dogmatic theology is a specialized form of systematic theology that is used to articulate and defend the theological doctrines of a particular organized church body. In other words, it's used to defend dogma of a particular kind of church. For instance, Roman Catholic the, uh, dogma, Presbyterian dogma, dispensational theology. Those all start with the beliefs of a particular Christian body and then go to scripture to find the things that defend why they believe that. So it organizes it in some of the same topics as systematic theology, but there is a, there's a built-in um, goal or bias, and I, and I don't mean that negatively, but an, an orientation toward demonstrating what a particular body believes. Okay? So it starts with, the, the dogmatic theology starts with what do we believe? And then, what can we find in scripture that tells us that's true? Now, obviously at some point, somebody has read scripture and said, we believe that you have to be completely immersed in order to be truly baptized, or sprinkling is okay, or you have to speak in tongues in order to be a true Christian, or whatever it is, but then they will go to scripture and to the history of the church, or whatever it is, to develop a, a dogmatic theology in defense of that. All right, make sense? And you get, you know, there are like reformed theology. I mentioned uh, Presbyterian dogma, but reformed theology to a great extent is a dogmatic theology because it looks at a reformed set of beliefs, which again developed out of biblical beliefs, but then in terms of presenting it as a theology, it starts with those beliefs and then goes into scripture and says, here are all the scriptures that support that belief. Okay, we're good now. You understand all that, right? So let me give you a little bigger uh, definition, maybe a little friendlier definition, of systematic theology. We can call systematic theology the art and science, because it's both. The art part is you have to have some discernment. The science part is you have to do the work. You know, what, what does the evidence of Scripture tell you? Science is examining evidence to draw conclusions. Well, Scripture does, you know, studying Scripture should do that. It's science in that regard. The art and science of knowing and understanding what we can about God in an organized way. That organized way is the thing that distinguishes systematic theology. Through the division of theological doctrines into systematic categories or groupings in order to better understand their final meaning and relevance for today. Again, a theology of angels, of salvation, etc. Now, sometimes... A systematic theology will be oriented around a thread or a theme that the, the systematic theologian feels like is, is a, a thing that unifies all of the system and helps you understand it more clearly. Covenant theology is an example of that. Covenant theology is a, is a prominent approach to theology, and they interpret all of the systems in terms of the covenant that God has offered, both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, it's the relationship between us and God, and everything is seen in light of that. So there are systematic theologies that are written from a covenant theology perspective. You might also get, let's say, an atonement focus to systematic theology. And everything is examined and articulated in terms of that thread or that theme. Doesn't mean they change the content, but whoever the systematic theologian who wrote that theology thinks that that is the thing that is most important to tie it all together. Okay? Covenant theology being one of the most common ones for the last 50 years. Okay? <clears throat> now, as I've suggested to you, uh, well, first let me tell you that, that in terms of doing systematic theology, I, I mentioned systematic theologians. Systematic theologies are written by people, usually men, at least until the last 30 years or so. Um, and because... They feel a, a person has been inspired to try to take uh, the systems and to come up with a different way, a new way, a slightly different angle to articulate these beliefs, perhaps because they think covenant or atonement or the righteousness of God or something else is a theme that they feel should be emphasized more, or simply because they feel like that what's been done before wasn't right or wasn't good enough. In particular, we have several historic ones that you should probably just hear the name of. In the 8th century, um, we had St. John of Damascus, um, who 
was a Greek and Eastern um, scholar. And after the split between Roman Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodox Church in 1054, that's when the Orthodox and the, and the Roman Catholics split, you know, the, the Greek churches in the East, the, the Latin Roman churches in the West, uh, John of Damascus in the 8th century wrote a theology, a systematic theology called the Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, which became the primary systematic theology for the Greek Orthodox churches, the Eastern Orthodox churches, after the split in the 11th century. And so St. John of Damascus, or John of Damascus, is one you will hear about. In the 12th century, Peter Lombard wrote a volume called The Sentences, which is a systematic theology. Um, one of the very most famous systematic theologies, which is Catholic, it is the systematic theology for the Catholic Church, is Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica. Uh, Aquinas is considered the premier theologian. Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo, was the only one who could be considered a challenger to Aquinas' title as being the premier theologian of the Christian Church. Aquinas is much more is Catholic, and so some of his doctrines we don't quite relate to as Protestants. Augustine um, is, is actually more accessible and has been more of a focus of Protestant theology, and he came you know, in the 400s, much before Aquinas. But you get Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica, the Lutherans, Philip Melanchthon, who was an, ass uh, an assistant and colleague of Martin Luther, wrote the Loci Communes, which is a Lutheran systematic theology. And then you get from a Reformed tradition, which is what the Presbyterians are, John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Faith, or Christian Religion, excuse me. Um, Calvin's Institutes is um, for... Uh, Melanchthon isn't as, as much recognized as Calvin is, Probably for Protestants, John, uh, John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion is, is the closest thing we have to the equivalent of the Summa Theologica by Thomas Aquinas on the Catholic side. Okay? Um, I had the great pleasure of studying Calvin's Institutes with J.I. Packer at uh, Regent College in Vancouver. Um, it's, we had, it was a seminar with only eight, or, uh, a whole class, but they called it a seminar because only eight students were allowed. Great stuff. Um, and Calvin's Institutes is the basis of Reformed theology, which is the theological tradition of the Presbyterian Church, which came out of Scotland, as well as all of the Reformed churches, like Dutch Reformed, Christian Reformed, uh, that came out of the Netherlands and spread all over the world. Okay? So all of those are different systematic theologies, which became foundational to understanding and led to movements. You know, Calvin's Institutes led to... Uh, his articulation through that systematic, systematic theology led to the Reformed churches and the Reformed tradition. Okay? Now, also, as I said, systematic theology is marked by the fact that it is always couched or presented in terms of certain categories or topics. And they actually start with a hierarchy of topics, and that's where systematic theology begins. Um, didn't mean to push that button. Um, an example of the kind of categories would be God, that's a good one to start with, uh, Trinitarianism, our doctrine of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the doctrine of revelation, the doctrine of creation, of divine providence, which we will look at as one of the topics for our, our study, theodicy, the doctrine of theodicy. Theodicy is a theological word which means how are we to understand suffering and pain in a world that is created by a God who is both all-powerful and all-loving. There's a word for that. Dealing with that as a doctrine, and it's called a theodicy. Um, theological anthropology, or what are we to understand about ourselves as, as human beings in light of our belief in God? Theological, the God part. Anthropology, the human part. Christology, soteriology, ecclesiology, which is the study of the church. Uh, eschatology, the study of the end times. Israelology, the study of Israel and how that fits into God's plan for the world. Bibliology, the study of scripture. Hermeneutics, which is the theology of interpretation. Uh, theology of sacrament, of pneumatology, the Holy Spirit, of heaven, uh, etc., etc. So you start with all systematic theologies start with some or all of those. They may have others. Um, if, particularly if they're coming from a particular theological orientation, a tradition of some kind. Um, any questions about that? Are we good? Your eyes haven't glazed over, have they? We're all right. <laughs> so, Russ, what you're saying is, is that hmm, 
systematic theology is, how do I say this? I mean, you got Schaefer, you got Wayne Grudem, you got all these guys that 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 don't say the same thing. You know, they, they, or at they, least they don't say it the same way. Yeah, it, I you have liberals and you have conservatives and you have all this. So a lot of it depends on who you choose. Exactly. See, Wayne Grudem, uh, Grudem's systematic theology, the act, the points he gets to are not different than other theologies that are available on the market. I mean, I looked at four or five to decide what book. The particular thing about Wayne Grudem's theology is he specifically wrote it for people who don't have a lot of theological background. That's why it's easier to read. And that's why I'm sure he felt motivated to do it. I, he, he looked, you know, he mentions Burkhoff's theology, which is probably the most popular of uh, modern theologies. Um, and yet, you got to, you know, you got to tighten your belt before you dig into Burkhoff. Um, or even Bart. Um, you know, some of, some of Bart's, you, you, you better be prepared before you dig into that. Grudem, and I'm, I'm putting words in his mouth here, he, I don't think he said that. He does say he felt the need to write a, a, a systematic theology for people who don't have a lot of background in theology. He gets to all the same points. It's a legitimate systematic theology from an academic point of view, but he presents it, he presents it in a different way. So the difference between the theologies are either they may have different beliefs in some cases, or it may just simply be they've chosen to express it in a different way because they felt like something was missing or needed. Okay? Um, but yeah, there are a lot of different theologies out there, trust me. Uh, Calvin's Institutes, one of the truly greatest ones. Again, you better be ready. You know, when you sit down and crack open the Institutes. Yes? Would it be fair to say that um, dogmatic theology is Systematic theology with a bias? Exactly. Yeah. Dogmatic theology is systematic theology, but they start with the intent that they are going to articulate and defend a particular doctrinal stance based upon whatever church they're coming out of. Catholic theology, for instance. Uh, or charismatic theology. So, or, so they start with a conclusion. Well, pretty they much. Build that up. Now, and again, at some point in the past, like I mentioned charismatic theology or Pentecostal theology, you might say. Um, at some point in the past, that church tradition has decided that this is what Scripture says and this is what we believe. But at some point, somebody went back and said, we need to articulate, we need to look at all of Scripture with that topic in mind. With that as the theme, let's go back and do all of our systematic theology by studying Scripture, but put it in light of or in, in the perspective of a Pentecostal orientation or a charismatic orientation. <laughs> so yes, it's intended to, to support that. Now, um, who knows what happens when you start that? For instance, Arminian, Joseph Arminius, or um, he was, uh, Johannes Ar Arminius, was a reformed <laughs> biblical scholar. And some people in the Netherlands went to him and said, we've got these people who are questioning John Calvin's theology of predestination. And so we want you to help us prepare an argument from scripture to really put these guys in their place. Well, Arminius spent time going through and studying this, and he came back and said, I've changed my mind. Mm -hmm. And he ended up offering the alternative theology just on the issue of predestination. In every other way, he was Calvinist. The alternative um, doctrine of predestination or election, which became Arminianism, named after him, okay? which is the, the doctrinal approach that the Methodists take. Okay, the Methodist Church is based upon a basically Armenian doctrine. Other than that, they're Calvinists, but they have a different idea about election and how a person is brought into salvation and all of that than Calvinism does. Now, even John Calvin doesn't agree with, would not agree with the Council of Dort. You know, the later, the later Calvinists who were so rigid, hyper Calvinism, all of that really rigid kind of, you know, well, looking at you, I think you're not elect. You must be going to hell. That sort of thing is not what John Calvin would have done. Right? But Arminianism came out of somebody going in to try to prove one dogmatic approach and deciding he didn't agree with it. Now, I think Arminius was, Arminius was wrong, because I was Calvinist. Wasn't he a student of Calvin? Well, uh, he had studied under, uh, under someone who had... He was one generation away from Calvin in terms of study, I think. But yes, he was very much a Calvinist. Okay. All right. In other words, uh, some folks take a position and then they go and write a book on theology to support their position 
and adjust the Bible accordingly. Mm -hmm. Well, not necessarily. Dogmatic theology does not necessarily adjust the Bible accordingly. It does, now, there are people who do that. Yeah, do. Okay, but not all dogmatic theology. Don't, dogmatic theology does not necessarily have to have a bad <laughs> ring to it. As a reformed theologian, which I am, I, if I were to write a systematic theology, I would write it from a reformed perspective. That doesn't mean I'm going to try to force the Bible to say something it doesn't or leave something out. Okay, uh, I'm, the, I'm the first one to say that I come from a Calvinist perspective because there are a lot of verses that I believe with regard to election would agree with Calvin. There are also verses that maybe will agree with Arminius, and I have to have some humility about that. But just because if I wrote a, a theology, it would come from my Reformed theological tradition, doesn't mean I'm going to twist the Bible in the wrong direction. So we can't, dogmatic theology is not inherently bad. We all do it. I mean, we all start with some system of beliefs that we bring to the task of doing theology. Anybody who thinks they don't already have some ideas about what's correct in theology is not paying attention. Okay. Chris? Would you say, though, that systematic theology is sort of, depending on who the author is and what his take on it, whether he's Calvinist or Lutheran, that it will reflect generally it would reflect that sort of dogma? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, mean it's not it, that it's bad, but it's like if you get a, absolutely. If you get, if you get a, a Lutheran one, it's, there's going to be some difference between that one and somebody that's re yes. reformed. For instance, Luther and Calvin, the two of the great leaders of the Reformation, although they were a generation apart, Calvin was not one of the, one of the first lights of the Reformation because he came a generation later. But Luther and Calvin are two of the primary leaders in the, in the Protestant Reformation, even though Calvin came later. Um, but they agreed on almost everything except the nature of the presence of Christ in the sacrament of communion. Luther um, could not accept that, uh, while Luther rejected transubstantiation in the sacrament, which means the Catholics believe, and still believe, that when they say the words of institution over the bread and the wine, that the bread literally becomes the flesh of Christ. And the wine literally becomes the blood of Christ. And the only reason we can't see it is because of our problem, not, not the problem with the change. Transubstantiation says it actually does change into the body and blood of Jesus. Luther didn't believe that. But he didn't know how to deal with the fact he didn't believe that and still have it be as important as he thought it should be. And so he came up with the doctrine of consubstantiation, in which he said, while it does not change into the body and blood of Jesus, the presence of Jesus is over, under, around, and through. Those are Luther's words. And I'm going... Marty, 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 Marty. What does that mean? You know? Calvin came along and said, in effect, that no change takes place. It is still bread and it is still wine. It does not become the body and blood. But it takes on, as we consume it in faith, it takes on all of the significance as though it really were. That it does not matter that it's still bread and wine, if we receive it in faith, it is for us as effective, as efficacious, as if we truly were consuming the body and blood of Jesus. Luther could not accept that. In fact, it wasn't Calvin at that point, uh, but it was Zwingli. Zwingli and Calvin were both in Switzerland. Zwingli came earlier. Zwingli was from Zurich. Calvin was later in Geneva. Zwingli and Luther, they had this big colloquy, and Melanchthon was one of the ones that tried to get them together. They got together and they looked at, like, I think it was 22 different doctrines. They agreed on 21 of them and said we should join forces if we can agree on these. 21 of them they agreed on. I believe it was 21 out of 22. My number may be slightly off, but it was something like that. But the one they could not agree on and that Luther would not give on is the issue of what is the nature of the presence of Christ in the communion. And the story is told that Luther, being a good German, sat at the table with his mug of beer pounding it on the table saying, this is my body, this is my body, which is Jesus' words. Okay. And he refused to have any, and so they didn't get together. All right? The Reformation continued to be splintered because they could not agree on that one doctrine. Now, there's an example where, yes, if a Lutheran theologian is going to write 
a systematic theology, when he gets to the nature of the sacraments, he is going to have a different approach to the nature of the presence of Christ in the sacrament of communion than is a Calvinist or a Zwinglian, although Zwingli did not actually, he, he did not create a, a theological movement, although he was, he was at the same time as Luther. Zwingli was doing the same stuff in Switzerland that Luther was doing in Germany, but was not as widely recognized for it. But as Calvin would, or as, uh, you know, as some other uh, leader in the Reformation, or in a tradition since then. A very different idea. We all bring our current understandings to the table. The question is, are we honest enough and humble enough that if we, if we find in Scripture something that tells us we've gotten something wrong, are we, will, are we willing to deal with that honestly? A lot of people aren't. Okay? Does that make sense? I mean, I, I wandered down a trail there, but I think it's useful for you to understand how we approach the theological task. And we do bring our previous understanding, our previous experience, even our prejudices, to any task, right? Theology included. And that's one of the things we need to be cautious about. Now, one of the reasons why we do theology is because not everybody gets it yet <laughs> in terms of the Christian faith. Um, Christian theology is based on our assurance that we can and do come to know God because He reveals Himself to us. We believe that as Christians, that we have a knowledge of God, or we can have a knowledge of God, and we can have a knowledge of ourselves and of what God desires for us because He reveals Himself. Not everybody agrees. Obviously, we have agnostics, people who say, I honestly don't know. Agnostic says, I don't know. Can you know? A skeptic who says, I really don't think so. You know, I'm skeptical about that. Pessimists who say, I'm afraid not. You know, it'd be nice, but I can't buy it. Secularists who say, I don't think that's important. What in the world will this belief in Jesus have to do with anything real? It's not going to get me a raise. It's not going to, you know, get my house clean when I need it. It's not, there's, I don't really care about that. I don't see how it's helping me. Um, one of the primary tasks of Christian theology is to prepare us to respond to those ways of thinking and believing. And I'll talk in a little bit about the fact that if theology is done right, it will always result in a greater understanding as to how we should live. Right theology, good theology, does, is not just a thinking thing. It, it may deal with a thinking thing. It may be a rational approach to understanding but if it's going to be good, it always has to end up affecting the way we live and affecting how we communicate the gospel. Too many Christians have, not, have been too lazy to understand why they believe what they think they believe, if they've even thought about what they believe. Let's face it, most Christians are lazy. Most people are lazy. Second Peter says... Always be ready to give an explanation for the, the hope that is in you, but to do so with gentleness and kindness. To me, that's an admonition that we're all supposed to be doing theology. We're all supposed to be prepared to explain to people who are in one of these categories, why do I believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that He saved me and that I will be you know, eternally with Him in heaven? Where does that come from? If I have never taken the effort and the time to study theologically what it is I really believe and how to articulate that, I have nothing to say to those people and they're not going to want to listen to me. So we have an obligation. Jesus said, go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How are we going to make disciples if we can't even explain what we believe? Right? Okay. I want to give you a brief, brief history of Christian theology. And again, I dealt with this in New Testament theology, but it will kind of give you a perspective. Before the Reformation, and the Reformation is counted as having started in 1517 when Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses, or, or challenge, basically debate points, it's issues to talk about, on the door of the Wittenberg uh, Cathedral. Prior to that, pretty much the only thing that existed was dogmatic theology. The only theology that was being done was being done in Latin, because all of the Bible had been translated into Latin at that point, the Latin Vulgate, by Catholic scholars and theologians in order to defend the beliefs of the Catholic Church. 
There was no such thing as a lay scholar studying scripture at that point because, for one thing, the Catholic Church believed that it, you had to be, um, you couldn't be a lay person and study scripture because you might get it wrong and that would be, that would be dangerous. So you had to listen to what priests or monks told you was in there. And always it was presented in the sense of defending Catholic doctrine. Okay, So dogmatic theology is all that existed before the Protestant Reformation. That may be, you know, you might have a few people like Erasmus or others who came along who may have been doing independent things, but not in any substantial way. Then you get the Reformation in the 16th century. And one of the major emphasis of the Reformation was sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. What that means is that scripture alone is the source of our understanding of the faith. The great cries of the Reformation were sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola scriptura, scripture alone. It's not by works, it's not because some priest told you you were okay, it's if you have accept the grace of Christ by faith in Christ, based upon what we learn in Scripture. So sola scriptura. When sola scriptura became the cry of the Reformation and the Protestant Reformation spread through Europe, there was an explosion of Bible study. One of the most important people to uh, promote that was Martin Luther, not just because he um, started the Protestant Reformation for the most part in 1517, but because one of the first things that Luther did when he was hiding uh, for a year and a half or so from from the authorities, is he translated the Bible into German and into a common language German, into a German that everybody could understand so that everybody could read it for themselves. In doing so, it's fascinating, Luther not only provided the scripture in the language people could read, but he invented modern German because he took the ancient German, I mean, they, you guys have heard Old English, right? Yeah. Doth thou proceed da da da. Well, they had the same thing in German. They had an old German, which was a version of high German. Luther, in translating the Bible into a common German language, he invented modern German. And so, very significant. But it gave people the ability to study the Bible in their own language. Commentary, scholarship just exploded. And it continued. In the 17th century, so we're, we're, you know, we're talking 100 years after that and more, we have Protestant scholasticism. These are people who really became the academics. <laughs> and there had been a Catholic scholasticism period and a Protestant scholasticism period. And they began to develop, at that point, systematic theologies. <clears throat> now that sounds good, except sometimes they got carried away. Where they were focusing on the mental exercise of thinking about and articulating theologies you end up with 16 volume the systematic theology where you know there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages on topics that nobody cares about you know a, a very popular one which really was a medieval debate was how many angels can dance on the head of a pin that's not made up that was really an issue in fact the story is told that when the the um, Turkish armies the Seljuk Turks were beating down the doors of Constantinople all of the theologians and church leaders were in the Hagia Sophia arguing over that very topic. How many, you know, here the Muslim armies are set upon capturing the city and destroying Christianity in, in Asia, which they did. Turkey, which used to be much the center of the Christian faith. Um, you know, the churches of Ephesus and Colossae and all the others, you know, the seven churches of Revelation are all in Asia Minor. Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey is now 98% Islamic. Carolyn sent me an article recently that, that although they, you know, Turkey is a, is a progressive, modern, secular state, they're actually beginning to take away churches and turn them into mosques. You know, so they're going back to some of that. It's very grievous to hear because we really like Turkey. But the point was that when that great threat to Christianity was there, instead of trying to deal with that, they're arguing over some minuscule point a theology that nobody cares about, nobody's going to benefit from. Okay, So they did get carried away. Scholasticism does not generally have a good name, although some of the scholastics did very valuable work, and it became the foundation for a lot of future uh, academic work and future theology, etc. But a lot of them, it was just a head trip. All right? 
Then we get to the 17th and 18th century enlightenment, uh, rationalism, the denial of the supernatural, including the denial of the supernatural nature of scripture and the reliability of scripture. Um, I will say, um, I'm going to get into that history a little bit later. I'm not going to do it right now, but I'll talk a little bit about that as we get into the second half. And then in 1787, a man, again, we studied this in the New Testament um, theology, a man named Johann Philipp Gobbler was appointed as the chair of a major university in Germany, and in his, his um, inaugural address, he presented the idea that biblical theology and systematic theology needed to be separated into separate disciplines. Sounds like a simple idea, but it radically changed the way theology was done. Because at that point, biblical theology started focusing on what was historical. It started looking at what was in Scripture, where did it come from, how do we know this is the accurate representation of what was originally written, and what has it meant for the church in the past. So it started with the Bible, the texts of the Bible, where did it, you know, how can we rely on it, what has it meant. Systematic theology became more doctrinal, in effect more practical in the terms of what is it we believe and how do we articulate it? Uh, it focused on what does scripture mean to us now. Systematic theology came to be a way that we can understand what we believe and especially how can we teach what we believe? Because by the very nature of it, is it's an organized, systematic way to think about this stuff and that makes it easier to teach. What do we believe now? And biblical theology began to have much more of a focus on what has been the belief of the church based upon the reliability of scripture in the past, okay? Now, systematic theology pretty much continued on the way it had been, you know, through before, through the scholastic periods and everything else, but it no longer felt the requirement to be dogmatic and focused as it had been, you know, prior to the Reformation, for instance, where it was only used to defend particular doctrines of the church. Biblical theology started pushing to discover what was behind and before the scriptures we have. Who were the authors? You know, is this a reliable copy of what was originally written, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And that led to the development of biblical criticism. Criticism, in this case, is not necessarily a negative word. When you talk about biblical criticism or literary criticism, it simply means thinking critically about something in terms of analyzing and thinking about it, you know, having an opinion about it. The scholarly study and investigation of biblical writing that seeks to make discerning judgments about those writings. Now, that um, turned into lower criticism, which became called textual criticism, looking at where did the Bible come from, what are the best texts, you know, what did it originally say and all that, textual criticism. And then higher criticism, which dealt with who wrote it, when was it written, um, all of that sort of stuff. And that's what got us into the place where people started questioning that Paul did not write six of the 13 books that were attributed to him, and you know that there's minuscule differences in the vocabulary that's used, or the grammar that's used, or we're not sure how this fits into the chronology of Paul's life, or whatever. That's all higher criticism kind of stuff. And it gets much more complicated than that as well. But that's kind of a real, real quick, you know, here's, here's how theology is developed. Now, again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit in terms of where liberal theology sneak, snuck in and you know, why liberal theology has never really affected either Eastern Orthodoxy or Catholicism, only Protestantism, okay? All of the liberal modernist theologians that have questioned the reliability of scripture or the existence of the supernatural or miracles or angels or demons or any of that, they were all Protestants because Eastern Orthodoxy was not concerned about this kind of systematic theology. They're more concerned about the spiritual aspects of the faith. That's why they have icons. That's why they have, you know, there's much more of an emphasis on the spiritual walk than there is on the rational understanding. Roman Catholicism didn't have a problem with liberal theologians because they clamped down on them and wouldn't let them do it. Right. But the Protestants, you don't have anybody in charge. There's nobody to say you can't say that. You can't do that. I'm not saying we should have. But um, the reason why Protestants are the only ones that had liberal theology is because we're the only ones that didn't have, that had an orientation toward a rational approach but did not have anybody in charge. Carolyn and I had experience, it was just a shock to me. We have two good friends, both of them, it's a couple, they're very wealthy. They have an extraordinary home on Maui, and uh, we, we, because of some mutual friends, we vacationed with them some and everything else, and we went to visit with them, and it was right after a, a Protestant TV preacher had said something really stupid, and it made all the news, a 
about somebody should should somebody should take him out. I mean, speaking of Hugo, uh, what's his Chavez. name? Chavez. 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 So now you know what I was talking about. Uh, <laughs> and our friends who are not Christians, I didn't realize how they have no understanding. The, the, the wife in this couple, both of them were bankers, both very well educated, very successful. And she said, isn't there somebody in charge that can tell him not to say things like that? <laughs> and he said, well, actually, no. no. <laughs> if it was Catholic, then yes. Okay, the Pope would do something. Or, you know, the Patriarch of Constantinople, if it was an Eastern Orthodox. Hey, although, the Eastern Orthodox churches don't usually say things like that, because that's not the way they think. In Protestantism, there's nobody in charge. And because there's nobody in charge, that's why liberalism, modernism, a denial of the supernatural, and so much of what the faith is built on, is entirely Protestant. Okay? We're going to take a break. I want to spend some time talking about dealing with objections to theology because I believe this is a real issue. And some of you have probably confronted it, maybe in your own life, maybe in someone you know. You may have had a pastor or a teacher, if you went to a, a, a small Christian college, who suggested to you that theology was a bad idea and were hostile to it. I believe that that results in a popular and pervasive misunderstanding about what theology really is and what it is supposed to do. That is not to say there's no such thing as bad theologians out there. There certainly are. They're all Protestants. But, <laughs> hey, I have to say that, and almost all of them are men, with the Lane Pagels being an exception. Um, and in fact, anyone, and this is kind of a premise I want to work with here, anyone who thinks about God or the ultimate questions of life is a theologian. Because the very word theology means to think about, to reason about God. So, if you've ever thought, what is the meaning of life? Or what is the nature of God? Then you are a theologian. And in fact, you need to own that and try to grow in that. So that you've got good answers to those questions you've asked. The only question we really can ask ourselves, since we all, all of us, it is the nature of humanity that at some point people ask themselves those kind of questions. In effect, everyone is some kind of theologian. The question is, are we going to be good theologians or are we going to be bad theologians? Are we going to come up with the right answers in a way that we can articulate it and apply it to life? Or are we going to become the kind of people who come up with wrong answers, heresies, false religions, or eventually lose our faith because we don't have any sort of means to articulate it in a way that even makes sense to us, much less makes sense to somebody else. And so the very point is, we are all theologians. Our job as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is to try to become good theologians. Now, in the absence of good theology, which is the product of good theologians, there is a danger that Christianity is likely to become a folk religion. And I'm going to talk about that the different levels of religious theology, or Christian theology. A folk religion is one in which beliefs are based sheerly on subjectivity, on what feels good to me, or on what is popular, rather than any kind of foundation, intellectual or reasonable foundation, that anybody else in society can find credible. People who are addicted to folk religion, meaning, you know, I believe what feels good, or I believe what's popular in my, in my particular uh, group of people, those people are never going to be salt and light to the world because they're never going to be able to present their Christian faith in such a way that anybody else is going to be interested in it. They're the ones that people laugh at. How can anybody believe that silliness? You know, I'm going to talk a little bit later about, you know, for many people, it amounts to a tabloid kind of religion. You know, meaning whatever, that... that Russian scientists digging a hole in the middle of the earth found the entrance to hell. That was a real caption yes. on the tabloid. And some people base their theology on that kind of stuff. Angels captured in New Mexico promised miracles if released. Or, you know, face of Jesus on, on oh, toast cancer. cures cancer. So you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. Those constitute folk religion, which are based upon legends or superstitions, that is not the kind of theology we're supposed to have. We have to have a theology that is thought through and makes sense 
and we can articulate, or we cannot fulfill the obligation to be salt and light to the world, or make disciples of people, because nobody's going to want to listen to you, if that's the extent of your religious or theological understanding, okay? Now again, everyone is a theologian, even though we have people who say happy is the person who is a Christian who has never met a theologian, because theology is any reflection on the ultimate questions of life, or the question of God. Our responsibility is to do good theology, okay? And I keep saying that because I want to hammer that in. Some people have the perception that um, theologians are some kind of awesome, frightening creatures that think deep and disturbing thoughts that an ordinary human being can't understand. Um, well, that might apply to some of the liberal, modernist theologians. <laughs> but that's not the case. Everyone asks the big questions. In that regard, everyone is a theologian. Um, the only difference is that there are some people who are called to be professional theologians or vocational theologians, meaning that their career choice or their call, if they are evangelical, is to, is to learn more about using professional tools, that is the biblical languages and other things, in order to be able to assist the church, the body of Christ, in doing good theology. But all of us, lay person, ordained person, you know, academic, whatever, our job as Christians is to become a thinking, reflecting Christian who understands our own beliefs in a way that we can articulate it to the world. Professional theologians, and I, I count myself in that realm, and lay theologians need each other. The only reason I do what I do, or that other theologians do what they do, professional theologians, is in order to be of service to the church. And the reason that you as lay theologians need to learn this stuff and need to practice theology is so that you can be a voice for Christ, a life for Christ, to those people who are just waiting for somebody to give them a sensible explanation for why they ought to believe this story of the Son of God who came as a baby, grew up, died on a cross, was resurrected, and is coming again. Okay? We have that job whether we're a professional theologian or a lay theologian. Okay. One good definition, let me give, well actually let me give you a couple definitions. I've already given you a definition of theology and this one is consistent with that. It's the study of God, it is from the Greek words theos, God, and logos, study or reason. Christian theology is thinking reasonably about God or the study and effort to understand God as he has revealed himself in scripture. Remember, ours is a revealed faith, a revealed religion. And so the, the practice of theology is to study what God has revealed to us. We're not making this stuff up. Okay? That is, I think, a good definition. Another definition, which I think is very helpful, goes back actually to the medieval times, and that is that theology is faith seeking understanding. All of the Christian faith is just that. It is faith. It begins with the heart, it begins with the change, becoming a new creature in Christ. But again, Jesus told us to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Once we have faith, once we have a changed heart toward Christ, we have an obligation. We've been given a mandate that we then need to try to also engage our mind in this, which is faith-seeking understanding. That's a definition for theology. Um, in, in fact, Anselm of Canterbury. Anselm of Canterbury was one of the great um, the intellectuals of the Christian faith. Um, and Anselm, in the 12th century, Anselm was the one who came up with many of the rational or, or logical arguments for the existence of God. Uh, the ontological argument is the one he's best known for. Just, just to give you an idea how this guy thought. The ontological argument says... If uh, God is that being greater than which I cannot conceive of. Got that much? Mm -hmm. God is the being greater than which I cannot conceive of. He's the ultimate being that I can conceive of in my mind. But then Anselm said, but you know what? A God, a, a creature that is the greatest of, or a, of a being that is the greatest of all things I can conceive of would be greater if he really existed than if he didn't really exist. So if he is the greatest being that I can conceive of, de facto, he must really exist. Now you may struggle with that, 
because people have struggled with it since the 12th century. But the idea is that the definition of God as the greatest being which we can conceive of has buried within that logic the fact that it implies a real existence, not a made up one. Because a made up being would be less than a being that we can conceive of that is real. Okay? Don't, maybe I shouldn't have given you that. Um, no, that's good. That's good. That's that, but that's good. an idea. Well, Anselm of Canterbury said, um, credo ut intelligam. Credo ut intelligam. And that means, I believe in order that I may understand. Now, Aquinas later, which is one of the one of the bugaboos I have about Aquinas, he, I mean he's great, but Aquinas said, I understand that I might believe. Aquinas was quite rationalistic about things. And so he believed that our mind was involved in coming to belief. Anselm takes a much more Protestant view, a much more evangelical view, and that is that I start with belief. I start with faith. But then I have an obligation to then come to understand to develop a theological understanding that allows me to articulate it to people who don't yet have the faith. Now, you're, you're never going to argue somebody theologically into belief. It doesn't work that way. But you may be able to diffuse some of the opposition they have to the faith sufficient that the Holy Spirit can break through. Right? That's part of our job. You don't theologically argue anybody into salvation, ever. It doesn't work that way. Only the Holy Spirit can inspire somebody's heart to accept this as truth. But frequently people have intellectual or social or whatever barriers that they will not turn loose of so that their Holy Spirit is open to the to or their heart is open to the Holy Spirit speaking the truth to them. Part of our job is to help tear down some of those barriers by being able to articulate our beliefs in a theological way that makes sense to people so that then the way is open for the Holy Spirit to touch their hearts. That's why this is important. That's what Jesus said when, uh, meant when he said, go into all the lands and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He didn't mean argue them into believing. He meant go tell them the story. Tell them what you believe. Tell them what God has done for you. And then the Holy Spirit can have a path to touch their hearts and bring them to faith in Him. Okay? Um, another definition... <clears throat> And by the way, a number of the things I'm going to be talking about here is from a little book, a little meaning, it's like 100 pages, called Who Needs Theology? Mm -hmm. It's by Stanley Grintz and Roger Olson. Stanley Grintz, uh, a number of his things I'm familiar with are very, very good. Uh, so Who Needs Theology? So some of these things. And their definition is this one at the bottom. That theology is reflecting on and articulating the God-centered life and beliefs that Christians share as followers of Jesus Christ in order that God may be glorified in all that Christians say and do. Now this book, Who Needs Theology, deals with some of the reasons why people object, and that's some of what I'm going to talk about, but it also has to do with um, how good theology needs to be done, and why it's important to us. And so the book is quite good. Um, I'd recommend it to you. So, reflecting on and articulating the God-centered life. Reflection is an important word there. It means to think about, to consider, to spend time with, you don't do theology on the fly. Okay, It takes time. There's a discipline associated with this, as there is with anything else. But this reflects the fact that all of us need theology. We need to do theology. We need to uh, receive theology from those who are good professional theologians in order to understand our own faith better. Okay, um, Everything I teach, no matter what it is, it's theology. Okay? Every time you think about God, every time you read Scripture and think about what it means, every time you listen to a sermon, every time you go to a Bible study, you're involved in theology. Because it's reflecting and articulating the God's in our life and beliefs that we share as followers of Jesus that God can be glorified in what we say to do. Okay? It is faith-seeking understanding. Now, it is important, again, the question is, are we going to be good theologians or bad theologians? Bad theologians don't do the work, they listen to the wrong people, they fall victim to heresy, and they end up creating problems for themselves and everybody else. Like some of the liberal theologians that invented the documentary hypothesis of the Old Testament, or whatever, if you've been in some of, some of the other classes. There are bad theologians. 
But you need to recognize that people who see bad theologians, and they see the terrible things that bad theologians have done, and they say theology is bad. But you know what? There are good cooks and bad cooks. There are good mathematicians and bad mathematicians. There are good drivers and bad drivers. If you ever eat something prepared by a bad cook, your response should not be, nobody should ever cook again. <laughs> right? And yet, when somebody says, happy is the Christian who has never met a theologian, they're saying nobody should ever cook again, or the equivalent of that. When in fact, we need to be fed with good theology as much as we need to be fed with good food. Right? Lynn? Don't you really believe we not only along that vein, we need to be questioning, searching, seeking. That's part uh, of it. Trying to get more of that understanding. Absolutely, and that's part of it, is searching, seeking, questioning. And not questioning in a cynical, skeptical no, kind of way, because that's what gets people curiosity. in trouble. But yeah. in a humble way. Okay? See, the difference is, if you question in a skeptical, cynical way, like many liberal modernist theologians have, and, and again, never, never misunderstand me and think that I don't believe in academic pursuits. You know, hopefully, it's clear I do. But there are bad academic, and I'm going to talk about academic theology in a minute. Um, but part of it is, if you ask questions cynically or in a negative, critical way, then it just festers. If you ask questions, serious questions, in a humble way, then you'll find answers. Humility is the lost Christian virtue, and it is the key to getting all of this right. We say we want to be good theologians. Approach it with discipline and humility, and you'll do good theology, not pride. In fact, a bad theologian, an academic theologian, which is the, the extreme of theology, I'll give you the categories, is a theologian who is more concerned about what he thinks about God than he is about God. <laughs> That's the definition of a bad theologian. More concerned about what he thinks, he or she, thinks about God than he is about God. Marvin? On a slightly different slant, I remember what you said to me when I said I had all kinds of questions, things I didn't understand. But know with what you do understand, what you do know. And you know, I'm realizing more and more there's so many things that we cannot understand. We can only partially understand that we can never be sure of. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just yeah. means that's what it is. That's our limitation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and I, I've said before, don't ever let what you don't know or understand overwhelm what you do know or, and understand. Reinhold uh, H. H. Richard Niebuhr, I think it was, of the two Niebuhr brothers, he once said, Christians should not be too fascinated by the furniture in heaven or the temperature of hell. <laughs> Meaning, yeah, we can get obsessed about all kinds of stuff that's not helpful and it just distracts us and takes us in the wrong direction. So don't be too obsessed by the furniture of heaven or the temperature of hell, okay? Um, some people object to theology because they say, aren't we supposed to come to Jesus like children, you know? Unless you come to me as a little child. But they make a mistake in confusing being simple and childlike with being simplistic and childish. Those are not the same things. If we come to Jesus in a childlike way, that means we come in a humble faith. We come willing to accept Jesus as our Lord and our guide, and we relish His presence and the comfort He gives us in the same way we would a loving parent. That's being childlike with Jesus, and that's the source of faith. If we come in a childish way, then we are selfish, we're demanding, we're prone to throw tantrums, we want everything our own way. We don't care what's right. We just want what we want. A friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, had a, a daughter who was three who was wanting something. He kept saying, no, Annie, you can't have it. No, Annie, you can't have it. And he said she planted her feet and put her hands on her hips and said, but I want what I want. Okay. Adults do that too. But even when adults do it, it's childish. That is not the same thing as coming to Jesus as a child in a childlike way, okay? And we need to not confuse those things. We can be childlike and still seek to rightly divine the word of truth that we're told to do, okay? Now, I want to give you um, five levels of theology and talk about them. Not all theology is created equal. 
There's good theology and bad theology, for sure, but there's five different levels of theology that I want to talk to you about. The first of those levels that I've mentioned already is folk theology. Folk theology is an unreflected believing that's based upon a blind faith or a tradition of some kind. It tends towards superstition. Okay? Um, it reflects a non-critical approach to the things we believe. Oh, you can't ask those questions. Uh, a beautiful illustration of this, again, back to Peanuts. The Gospel According to Peanuts is where some of the cartoons I'll show you now in a minute come from. And there's one in there, and Linus is praying. And his sister comes up, and Linus says, you know what? I discovered an important truth. If you hold your hands upside down, you get the opposite of what you prayed for. <laughs> that is not that different than some people's folk theology approach to things. You know, they, they develop these ideas. And it's also true, a you might describe this as a bumper sticker kind of theology. Um, there are some great bumper stickers out there. And then there's some horrible ones. There's, there's some horrible ones because they're not true, but some horrible ones because they simply go in the wrong direction. Um, one of the bumper stickers or slogans that was popular and people were very proud of this is, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Mm. How does that help us be salt and light to the world? Yeah. How does that help us bring other people into a saving knowledge of Jesus? How in the world is that something positive? That is an example of folk religion. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Now that may be true, but when you put an exclamation point at the end of that, you just shut yourself off in a way that can be really dangerous and non-productive. You see that? That is not helpful. It is not a way to make disciples. And we need to be careful about that. I've already mentioned, you know, the tabloid theology, the fact that some people get their beliefs from superstitions or, or false reports or anything that sort of captures their imagination. Particularly, folk theology has to do with something that feels good. I have, I have friends who are charismatic, and do not misunderstand what I'm about to say, charismatic or Pentecostal. One of the dangers of the charismatic and Pentecostal movements is that it is too, it's very prone, and I've had, I've had friends who are Pentecostal, been involved in charismatic fellowships. There is a real danger of falling into the experience. If I'm not having the experience of speaking in tongues or you know, prophetic utterance or interpretation or whatever, then I'm missing something. Okay? The Christian faith is not just subjective. Believe it or not, it's not all about me. And it's not all about you. And it's not all about the experiences we have as part of our faith. There are objective truths about God and Jesus Christ that we need to recognize. And if my whole Christian life is trying to go from one peak of experience or subjective positive feeling to the next, then I have a problem. I am never going to have a mature Christian faith if that's the way I approach what I believe, my theology. That is not to say that is true for all Pentecostals and Charismatics. Do not misunderstand me. But there is a danger of that because of the experiential aspect of Charismatic and Pentecostal experience. All right? Now, we need to make sure that we do not fall victim to this unreflective kind of belief that's based on subjective feelings or legend or rumor or slogans. Any of those things that resist any kind of reasonable examination. God is the God of all truth, and he is not afraid of us asking serious, humble questions. And yet, one of the characteristics of folk religion is you can't challenge it, you can't question it, because if you do, then you are committing the sin of doubt. Right? Does that sound familiar to you from any of your experiences in the past? That is not a beneficial kind of theology, but it is quite common. Now, and I'm from the South, where it's especially common. Um, you, example would be the, the churches that handle snakes. Taken from one passage in Mark, that you will take up the serpent and you know you will you'll not be affected by the poison and all that. Um, when in fact, it, there's no scholar, no scholar that I know of that believes that's that's legitimate. They believe it was added later. Okay, um, and, and only like one manuscript. 
It's not, it doesn't exist in most of the early copies we have of the Book of Mark. And yet there is a whole religious movement that believes that they, they are sign followers, is what they call it. They drink poison, see if they're going to die. They handle rattlesnakes and cottonmouth snakes to see if they're going to get bit. And if they get bit, are they going to die? And they always have an explanation for why it is that somebody did die or didn't die because of that. I'm sorry, but that's wacky. And it's not defensible by anybody's standard based upon what Scripture says. Not any valid version of the Scripture. I'm sorry, if we've got any snake handles here that I just told you. I don't recommend it. That's what I'm saying. What's that? I just forgot that. They're all dead. Yeah, they are. Okay. A second kind of theology, which is, uh, which is light years ahead of uh, 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 folk theology, is lay theology. This occurs when lay Christians, that is not professionally trained Christians or professional ministers or ordained people, whatever, when Christians dig deeper into the sources of their faith, especially through a more serious study of God's Word, when they put their hearts and minds together to not only have an experience of faith, but an understanding of what it is they believe in their faith. Um, and again, it's lay because it does not involve using the more sophisticated tools of theological inquiry like the biblical languages or the historical precedents of the church or any of that. It is simply a personal desire to understand what we believe better. If you have ever been in a church service and they were singing a song and you said, I'm not sure I believe what the words of that song are saying, then you are practicing good lay theology. You're asking those questions. And that's a good thing. If you've ever heard a sermon and said, I don't think I agree with where he's going with that. You, know, you didn't jump to your feet and scream, heretic, or anything like that. <laughs> because trust me, that throws a pastor off when you <laughs> but, but again, that people are willing to say, is that the words of that song or that sermon, that interpretation, that Bible study, is that consistent with what I believe Scripture has taught me? That's lay theology. It's almost the opposite of folk theology because you're not just taking it because somebody told you this is what you were supposed to believe. Now, again, it's not cynical. It's not critical. That's not good lay theology. It simply is humbly saying, is this true? Because we are told we are supposed to question those things mm -hmm. in order to make sure that we are finding the right truth. And we need more lay theologians. You all, even if you don't pursue a degree or do anything more than that, you all need to be lay theologians for your sake and the sake of the other people in your lives. Okay? Questions about that? You see the difference, right? Uh, Third, I got, a question. I got a question. Yeah. Um, excuse me. <coughs> These, this outline here, is that from that book that... It is from... Grintz? Yeah, Who Needs Theology. Okay. Who was yeah. the author again? Um, Stanley Grintz, G-R-E-N-T-Z, and Roger Olson, O-L-S-O-N. Okay? Thank you. And Grintz, anything you give by Stanley Grintz is going to be good. Um, ministerial theology is the third level. Ministerial theology is a reflective faith that generally is practiced by ministers and trained teachers in the Christian faith. It ju doesn't just mean ordained people. Anyone who studies in order to be able to teach a Bible study or preach or exhort or evangelize in the church, anyone who takes a leadership role and prepares themselves theologically for that is practicing ministerial theology. It is the next step up from lay theology. Lay theology is pretty much somebody asking, you know, do I believe that or is that, does that seem right to me? And studies for that reason. Ministerial theology is somebody who takes the next step and prepares in order to minister to other people for that. And it therefore requires more study, more preparation, etc. The fourth level is professional theology. Now this again is further, each of these is a step further along the theological spectrum. Professional theology requires professional preparation for theology as a vocation. And it means that the professional theologian is committed to reflecting and teaching as their vocation. This is their job. Now this is what I do. Um, and, and some of you want to do that. That's why you want to pursue the whole you know, the whole kit and caboodle of the courses we offer here and get the, the, the master's degree, master of theology and ministry. Um, 
It means that you feel, and, and we believe as Christians, that this requires a call of God. A profession. Now, anybody can be involved in ministerial theology if they feel God is calling them to just teach a class. But God, if, if you're going to be involved in professional theology, it should be, as an evangelical, I would say, and you hopefully would say, that that involves a call of God on your life, that this is what God wants you to do with your life. We just ordained Guillermo last Sunday uh, as a minister of the Word and Sacrament in our church because he feels a call of God on his life that he is to commit himself full-time to the ministry of the church. And in the process, he is, he's already taken a whole bundle of classes at the Reformed the uh, Seminary in Guadalajara and is now taking all the courses here. So he feels a call of God on his life to approach a, both a ministerial and a professional theology uh, goal and is preparing himself for that, for full-time service. That's a big part of the difference. Okay? And then there's a last, a fifth category, which is the worst. Even worse than folk theology. Okay? And that is academic <laughs> theology. I don't have a problem with academics. I consider myself an academic to a great extent. But academic theology, as I said before, are those people who are more interested in their own thoughts about God than they are about God. They want to hear themselves talk rather than listen to God. All right? Now, these are the theologians that give theology and theologians a bad name. It's people like that, the academic theologians, are the ones that caused, you know, Bethany College to say we'll never have a professor of theology or happy is the Christian who doesn't meet, never met a theologian or whatever. Too often, and I say this with grief, too often these people either have lost their faith or they never really had any. And they pursued this purely as an academic exercise. That's why we call it academic theology. Because there simply isn't the heart underneath it. There isn't the faith in support of it. These are people like Elaine Pagels. Forgive me if she's a hero of somebody. The Jesus Seminar Scholars. <laughs> My nemeses. I guess if that's the plural of nemesis. The Jesus Seminar Scholars. I, I pray for them. That God would... Not give them what they deserve. Uh, <laughs> or Bishop John uh, Shelby Spong in the Episcopal Church. He has done more damage. You know, he's an ordained bishop in the Episcopal Church. He's retired now. Who denies everything. Jesus isn't divine. The scripture is not God's word. There's no such thing as miracles. And on and on and on. Okay? And yet, he's a bishop in the Episcopal Church. Now, many Christians make the mistake of thinking there's only two kinds of theology. Folk theology, which is based not upon study and reason and any history or understanding, but rather upon superstition and bumper stickers and slogans and, you know, uh, rumors. Or it's academic theology, which is in danger of destroying our very faith. Those two options are both wrong. And the only way we're not going to either fall into folk theology, which is, I don't believe honoring to God, ultimately, even though people may be thinking they're honoring God, or academic theology, which is clearly not honoring God when it denies you know, the divinity of Christ, the you know, reliability of Scripture, the presence of miracles, the spiritual being, all of that. Those are not our only two options. In fact, those are the two options we should reject outright as being inadequate understandings of what theology are, it should be. <coughs> we need more people in the church who are lay theologians. In fact, every Christian should be at least a lay theologian. Every one of you. Every Christian should be a lay theologian who asks the questions, the big questions of life and of God, seeks the answers in a way that is that makes sense and also feeds your spirit. Some of you are called to be ministerial theologians, meaning you take the next step where you do additional preparation theologically in order to teach or preach or exhort or evangelize. Some of you are called to be professional theologians, meaning you are going to spend more time studying, learning to use the professional tools, learning the biblical languages, to be able to prepare a much, much more in-depth um, effort of theology for the sake of the church. Now, the Christian church needs lay theologians, it needs ministerial theologians, it needs professional theologians, all of those. 
Why do we need those theologians? Well, obviously, for our own sake. But there are several critical tasks that good theology needs to do for the sake of the church and for the Christians. Now, one of the things, um, well, let me start with this. The, the theology has two critical tasks and two constructive tasks. And again, I get this from Grintz and uh, Olson, but I think it's, it's really quite brilliant. Uh, <clears throat> The first critical task, and critical means, again, not to be negative, not to be tearing down, but to be willing to examine to determine if it's right. That's what being critical means. First, to examine and evaluate Christian beliefs. Is Mormonism the same as Orthodox Christianity? No. It's not. There are beliefs in Mormonism that are inconsistent with a biblical Christian faith, and there are biblical Christian doctrines that are lacking. And ultimately, it has the most important one of those has to do with the nature of Jesus Christ. It is a theologian's job to be able to make those discernments. Somebody who has studied, who has examined these things, who has prepared themselves, who has a broad understanding of what God has revealed to himself in his word, and in the history of the church that God the Holy Spirit has directed, so that when these alternate ideas come along, there is someone who is prepared and equipped to be able to say, that's not right. That's not what we believe. We being the Christian church. Okay? That is not consistent with what we believe. And that's not, nor, that's not a way of saying, you can't say that, you don't have a right to say that. We believe everyone has a right to believe what they want. But Christian theologians have the responsibility of saying, yes, the people that believe that have a right to believe it, but we don't have to believe it too because it's not right, and here's why it's not right. So the idea of examining and evaluating Christian beliefs, especially to be able to determine, are they correct or not? Are they heretical or are they not? Okay? Um, and let me, let me, I'll throw this in here. Well, uh, I'll get to this in a second. I'm, uh, it's so many things I want to tell you. Um, and so that's part of the job of theology, is being able to discern, is it true or is it false? Is it right or is it wrong? With regard to what we believe as followers of Scripture, okay, as Christians. Secondly, in terms of a critical task, is categorizing valid Christian beliefs as dogma, doctrine, or opinion. By the way, opinion doesn't need to be underlined there. It should be uh, italicized. I clicked the wrong button. It's not the opinion's most important part. And this, I think, is a good way to think about our beliefs. And it's a, it's a traditional way of doing it. <coughs> that what we believe, our Christian beliefs, fall under the categories of either dogma, doctrine, or opinion. The difference in meaning is a dogma is something that we believe is absolutely required for the Christian faith. The belief that Jesus Christ was both fully God and fully man, that he was the divine son of God who came to earth, that he physically died, was physically resurrected, and was coming in, those are dogma in almost every branch of Christianity. In other words, you don't believe that, you really shouldn't be calling yourself a Christian. Because that's what it means to be a Christian. So the beliefs that absolutely are necessary are called dogmas. Then we have a second category called doctrine. The doctrines are those beliefs which we believe are true, and we believe even are important, but you're not going to miss out on your salvation if you don't believe them. An example of that would be the virgin birth. There are very strong reasons why the virgin birth contributes an important understanding to our understanding of the nature of Jesus and of God's action in, in Jesus being born to Mary and all of that. There's, and so the virgin birth is a doctrine which we believe is important, but somebody's not going to be, you know, be kept out of heaven because they had trouble accepting the virgin birth. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that kind of like saying, it doesn't, it's not important to my salvation whether I'm baptized with water or submerged? Exactly. Now, and you make an important point, uh, the issue of like baptism. Do you have to be submerged? Do you, can you be sprinkled? Different religious groups, different denominations will put certain doctrines in different places. Somebody who is a, you know, a dyed-in-the-wool Southern Baptist, and I'm saved as a Southern Baptist, so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> no, I'm Presbyterian now. A, a really strict Southern Baptist would say, if you are not fully immersed in baptism, or if you, you know, if you 
professed your faith in Jesus at a Sunday night service and you were going to get baptized next week and you died in a car wreck on Wednesday, they would say you're not going to have it. <laughs> okay? Um, and so they would say if you got sprinkled, you're not really baptized. We had a dear lady in our church who passed away a couple years ago. And um, I, we had a, somebody who was baptized. They'd never been baptized. They made the professions of faith. I baptized them. <coughs> I sprinkled them. Okay? And afterwards, this dear woman came up to me and said, I would love to be able to tell my dear sister how, how wonderful it is and congratulate her, but she hasn't really been baptized. Because she was not immersed. Now, some people put that as an example in dogma. You have to be immersed or you're not saved. Most churches would put that, you know, and, and other things under perhaps doctrine, you know, that maybe, maybe they believe it's important that you be immersed in following the model of Jesus, but you're not going to be not saved if you don't. So doctrine are the ones that we think may be important, but they're not an issue of salvation or not. And then opinion are the ones, which is where I would put that the sprinkle or dunk baptism. <coughs> Those are the things where we would say, um, and, and there's actually a name for this in theology, the adiaphora, which means the gray areas. You can go either way. You know, it's it's not it's certainly not a matter of your salvation. It's probably not even you know a, a very important doctrine. You can go either way on that. Okay. Um, the ecclesiastical structure of the church. You know, there's three different ways that basic ways that churches are structured. The Episcopal form has a bishop as the head, Catholic, Anglican, Methodist. The Presbyterian form has elders. That's what Presbyterian means. A presbyteros is Greek for elder. That's what we are. And, it's, and we're not the only ones. There are a lot of other churches that have elders who are elected from the congregation. That's where the authority is. And then the third model is congregational. That's like the Baptist churches. Technically, there's nobody that can tell them what to do. Each congregation is independent. In those cases, usually the minister carries a lot more power. Which one's right? Or is one right? That would fall, in my, opinion, in my idea, under opinion. Some people think one is more biblical and more important. Another, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that that's going to matter. I don't even think that there's a strong doctrinal you know, advantage to one or the other necessarily. So dogma, necessary for salvation. Doctrine, important, has a lot of meaning and ramifications like the virgin birth, believe in the virgin birth, but not going to make a difference in salvation. And then opinion. It could go either way. What do you prefer? A lot of people make the mistake. In fact, one of the dangers of folk religion um, and of the more strict fundamentalist uh, Christian groups, they tend to push everything into the dogma side. <laughs> if, you, if you question that, then you must not be a Christian. You must not be saved. Liberal theology pushes everything into the opinion side. Nothing really matters. It's easy going. The ultimate example of that is uh, the Unitarian Universalists. There is no law, there is no, nothing that will change your state in terms of being salvation or not in the Unitarian Universalists. I'm not picking on them, that's just a fact. That's where they fall, okay, uh, as an example. So I think it's helpful for us as we think about theology to realize some things are dogma, necessary for salvation, some are doctrine, they're good, they're good beliefs and they have important meaning, and some are just opinion. We're not going to be blown one way or the other by that. And different groups put beliefs in different categories. Yes, John? You know, that's real good because <coughs> the body of Christ has always been kind of tribal. There's mm -hmm. always yeah. these different groups. And, and where do you establish fellowship with another group that's not your own, mm -hmm. and where do you not? And when you look at this, you see dogma. These are the non-negotiables. But doctrine and opinion, you know, we can we can fellowship with this group over here that's got different doctrines or opinions yep. than we do because we're the same household. Right. But, but Israel, you hold the same doctrine. You no, know, Israel was always under twelve different flags, you know, and we are the same. But dogma, you know, is that that issue that's not it's just not negotiable. Right. And then, but doctrine and opinion, that just that just that just makes us. And our, we can still walk and our tendency to try to make, again, conservative, the more conservative, the more likely to try to make things that don't need to be dogma, dogma. <clears throat> I recently was in a conversation, I'm not going to tell you who I was talking to, 
and they had been part of the church, and that church said that when they offered communion, it didn't matter if you were a baptized believer in Christ, if you were not a member of that church, if you took communion, you were eating and drinking condemnation on yourself, and God would judge you for it. Or a member of a local church, or any local church. Well, a member of a you local church. A even, if you had moved, even if you were an ordained elder in four different churches, you just moved into town, you come to this church and they're serving communion, right. if you took communion, you're eating and drinking condemnation on yourself. And I'm thinking, really? <laughs> I, I don't see it. I don't find it. I, I would put that idea in a very different place in that, those categories. Okay? So different groups do interpret them differently. So these are the two critical tasks. Helping identify what beliefs are true and which ones aren't. Okay? Evaluating those beliefs. And secondly, helping us understand which ones are truly most important versus pretty important Versus, I can go either way. Theologians are supposed to help do that, whether they're lay theologians, ministerial theologians, or professional theologians. The bigger questions fall under professional theologians. And those are very real issues, folks. For instance, and I'm just going to throw this out here, I'm not going to get involved in the conversation with it right now, or we'll be here for the next four hours, and that is the current uh, societal view toward the practice of homosexual relationships. How do we deal with that based upon what Scripture says? So this stuff gets very real, very fast. If you have a friend, a family member, whatever, who is gay and involved in a relationship, and they come to you and say, what do you think? What do you think? Are you prepared to answer that question? Because it becomes not just a practice, it becomes an issue of what do we believe about that. So it is a theological issue. Okay? Marvin. You just need to add to that divorce and birth control. Exactly. Oh, yeah. you know, and you're exactly right. See, the thing is, churches are always quick to condemn people involved in homosexual relationships or people who, you know, are adulterers or whatever. And eight out of ten church leaders have been divorced. Jesus said more about don't get divorced than he did about anything else. Mm -hmm. And on that list at least. Yeah. Okay, not about anything else, but about that list in terms of a moral act. Really? How quick are we going to be here to, make the, to draw those lines, folks? Okay? And again, those are theological questions. And that doesn't mean they're going to have easy answers. But theologians don't always find easy answers. In fact, the more you proceed in terms of theological inquiry, the, the bigger and more difficult the issues you're going to deal with. But somebody's got to deal with these issues for the church to know what to do. Okay? For you to know what to do. It's a, it's a serious business. So in addition to theology's two critical tasks, theology also has two constructive tasks. Critical task is to look at, evaluate, and, and give a judgment about things. Judgment not meaning necessarily negative, but an evaluation of things. But there are two constructive tasks that theology should do. The first is theology needs to construct models of diverse Christian teaching. That means do systematic theology. Or else, even if you're not going to write a systematic theology, to have some sense, what does our church believe about the sacraments? Which things do we include as a sacrament? The Catholic Church has seven of them. We have two. Well, why do we say we have two instead of seven? What do we believe is the nature, we talked about earlier with Luther and, and uh, Zmainly, what do we believe is the nature of the sacrament? What is the pres what's the nature of the presence of Christ in communion? What happens when you're baptized? If you're not baptized, are you not going to go to heaven? You know? So the idea to think in terms of here is our theology of the sacraments, or here is our theology of the fellowship of the body of Christ. Here is our theology of uh, how the church should be organized and governed. So theologians are responsible for thinking about those things in, in models of uh, unified models that give us a handle when we need to, you know. The Presbyterian Church, for instance, has two books that, that make up our Constitution. One is the Book of Creeds, that is the historic creeds starting with the Apostle Creed until uh, the 1980s that have been written for the Church. The other part is the Book of Order. And the Book of Order tells us how to do church. Well, somebody had to sit down as a theologian based upon what we believe and decide to how to organize that as a model so that when I need to find out what do I need to do to baptize somebody? I know where to look. 
There was a theologian that did that for me and helped me with that. Okay. The second constructive task is to relate those models in a relevant way to a contemporary culture. Now, the, the thing that liberal and modernist theologians did that took them in the wrong direction was they decided contemporary culture was the ultimate good and that scripture and theology and, the, and Christianity needed to come along and do whatever was necessary to make culture feel good about itself. That's not what our faith is. But you know what? If we do not think about our beliefs, our theology, our Christian faith in a way that can be applied to the contemporary culture, can answer the questions that people in the world have, can address the needs and hurts in the world, unless somebody is taking the responsibility as a Christian theologian to think about how do we address the needs in the world and answer the questions the world has, we might as well all go home. We are told to do that. And so theologians have the responsibility for taking what we believe and figuring out, without compromising those beliefs, how do we apply that to a world that is hurting and questioning and in need of a savior and of comfort? That's what theologians are supposed to be doing. And that includes lay theologians who have friends who don't know the Lord as much as it does ministerial or professional theologians. We have that obligation. Okay. Um, this is what we are called to do. This is what you are called to do. You are all theologians. If you weren't before you walked through that door, you are now. <laughs> okay? I hereby proclaim and bless you as theologians. Um, is that audio from that you just did? No. Um, I, I quoted, actually, Reinhold Niebuhr is the one I quoted earlier who said that Christians should not be too concerned about either the furniture of heaven or the temperature of hell. Um, I mentioned liberal theology. <clears throat> well, in saying that we apply what we believe to a the needs of a contemporary culture, again, good theology comes from a source of faith, a heartfelt faith. It applies our mental, cognitive abilities to understand that faith better, and then it applies it to the realities of how we live our lives or it's not good theology. If it stops short, before it actually gets applied to life, then it's not really good theology. That's where the academic theologians fall. You know, they don't start with the heart, they just do, they're only in the middle, they're only in the head. But we always have to think about, it starts in our heart, we use our head, and then it applies to our hands. What do we do in reaching out to the world? And that's what our theology is for. If it's not doing that, and helping in a relevant way the contemporary culture around us, then we're not doing good theology. The danger, the failing of liberal theology has been that they gutted all of the supernatural, all of the miraculous, all of the meaningful out of the faith so that it no longer applies to anybody, really. Several churches in the United States made a very conscious decision a number of years ago that in an effort to try to draw more people in and not feel any, let anybody feel rejected, that they were not going to be dogmatic. They were not going to clearly say, this is what we believe. If you want to be a member of our church, this is what you need to profess to. Those churches include the Methodist Church and the Episcopal Church. On the other end of the spectrum, a number of the fundamentalist and Pentecostal churches especially have persistently said, this is what we believe. You're welcome to come, but if you want to be a member, if you want to be a leader, if you want to participate in a meaningful way, you need to agree that this is what you believe. They were quite dogmatic about that. Which churches are growing and which ones are dying? The dogmatic churches, and I don't mean that as a negative, but those who have said, this, this is what we believe. We want you to be part of us, but you have to agree you believe it too. Those churches are growing. The Anglican Church, the Methodist Church are dying, or the Episcopal Church, rather, in the United States. The churches that have taken a liberal stance and said nothing really means, you know, there is no dogma. You know, out of, and I'm sure it was out of a well-intended, although mistaken, idea that that's how they could minister more people. Ultimately, whether they're consciously aware of it or not, people know down deep whether something means anything or not. They can tell. Even if they can't cognitively say, this is what's wrong with that, they can tell whether there's anything of substance there or not. Liberal theology has really damaged the reputation of Christ. 
Um, Richard, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who I quoted earlier about the heaven of, uh, furniture of heaven and the temperature of hell, his brother H. Richard Niebuhr, in describing liberal theology, says this. In liberal theology, a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without a judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. They took everything that means anything out of it, and people know that. And the churches that try to present that kind of theology are not long for this world. In an open circle. <laughs> open circle. Yeah, I've nice. never been to open circle. I haven't either. <laughs> okay. Um, oops. Oh, where's my other cartoon? Mm. <laughs> no Something stuck. Hmm. Your cursor is on there. Ah, there he is. Peanuts again. Snoopy and Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown says, I hear you're writing a book on theology. I hope you have a good title. Snoopy says, I have a perfect title. Has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? <laughs> I have confidence in the theology I have studied and that I teach and present. I'm not going to suggest that, that you know, I'm wishy-washy about all this stuff. But I also have some humility. And we need to have humility to recognize that we do the best we can and we might get something wrong. Some of you have heard me say over and over again that I believe there's going to be a whole lot of forehead slapping when we get to heaven. How did I get that wrong? How did I miss that? Why didn't I understand that? And we have to recognize that God calls us to a noble task that is not easy sometimes. The task of theology. But there's nothing better you can spend your time on. Because it both is for your sake and for the sake of those that you will meet in life. So recognize that you might be wrong about something, but don't let that scare you. We have a job to do it. As long as we do it with humility, by seeking God's presence and His blessing and His direction, and we do the work. <coughs> the theology is a great thing. Mm -hmm. It's great fun. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I just have one scripture that goes exactly with what you said. It's Proverbs 25 2. It says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and to search out a matter is the glory of kings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Search out a matter is the glory of kings. That's theology. Thank you all, everybody. I appreciate it. Next week we will deal with the theology of the Word of God, and it will be fun.